we're gonna oh thanks Flannery um so we we're going to do a quick overview of the current political context and the media opportunities available to you and then we're going to reserve some time um, to open up a question and answer basically so you can ask us anything and we will try and answer it for you so um let's just get started right away with flannery has been working hard constantly to to keep us up to date with whatever's happening and it changes all the time. So I know she was working on this right before we got here tonight. Yes, it has been, there's been a lot to keep up with, which is good. If there wasn't anything to keep up with, it would, it would not be as good of news for the climate. So, um, so I am, as Charlotte said, uh, well, for those of you, if anybody doesn't know me, I'm Flannery Winchester, I'm CCL's communications director. Um, and so I'm going to try to just distill the, the current political moment as it relates to our policy goals for you, because I know that it is a whirlwind right now. There's a lot going on. Um, so, uh, so here's where we are. We are in potentially the, the best place that we could possibly be right now. Uh, it may not feel like that, <laughs> um, but things are looking really, really positive. Um, so last Friday, the New York Times put out a huge piece on carbon pricing, uh, and I'm going to drop this link in the chat for anyone that hasn't seen it yet. Um, it was in our weekly briefing this week, um, but it is worth revisiting. So, uh, so here's a quote from the beginning of that New York Times piece. Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, confirmed that the Senate Majority Leader had asked him to craft legislation that would put a price on carbon emissions, but to ensure that the policy would respect Mr. Biden's pledge not to raise taxes on families earning less than $400,000. That could be done with some kind of rebate or carbon dividend. So let's just take a minute to let that sink in. The majority leader of the Senate told the chairman of the relevant committee in the Senate, yeah, go ahead and do a carbon fan dividend. Um, so, and that's being confirmed by the paper of record for the whole US basically. Um, so that's, that's a moment, this is an exciting time. Um, and so, and that's just the beginning of the piece. <laughs> so in the rest of the piece, um, a lot of CCL's arguments for a carbon fee and dividend were actually repeated by the journalists themselves. So my favorite thing that they wrote is, quote, depending on how it is structured, a tax on carbon pollution could be the single most powerful policy enacted by the United States to tackle climate change. Um, and then later on down the piece, it just gets better and better. Uh, the Times piece also quoted CCL. So the piece had kind of a focus on Kirsten Cinema. Uh, so they were talking a lot about Arizona. And they quoted us as saying, uh, well, Steve Valk, one of our other communication staffers, um, quoted him as saying, our volunteers have placed 1,444 ca calls and emails to Arizona Senate and House offices in the last few months, wrote Steve Valk, a spokesman for the Citizens Climate Lobby, which wants a price placed on carbon pollution. So your grassroots efforts to push this policy are now being nationally recognized. Um, so that was all just in one piece from the New York Times. There was also a really positive article from Bloomberg on Friday, um, and I'll drop this article in the chat as well, in case you haven't seen this one. Um, but Senator Wyden has another quote in this piece, and he says, it's projected that making polluters pay when combined with clean energy tax credits would lower the cost of clean electricity for Americans. So that quote is really interesting is, and it's telling because not only is the news about carbon pricing out there in the spotlight, but we're starting to see the relevant lawmakers on the, on the offensive about the benefits of the policy. Um, and the Bloomberg piece also uh, underscored that this, the whole policy idea is picking up steam and it kept the dividend front and center. So the, uh, the journalists who wrote the Bloomberg piece said, um, quote, though several Senate supporters have been eyeing the reconciliation bill as a potential pathway for this tax measure for more than a year, it's gained momentum over the last several weeks. The, the tax is appealing because of its role as a potential revenue raiser, but lawmakers are also working to ensure that a significant chunk of the proceeds goes back to middle and low income families. 
Uh, so there's some major positive media out there and it is about as squarely focused as you could hope on the policy that CCL has been working for for years that you guys all have been working for for years. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. Um, and I know that we were all kind of looking to September 15th as this, uh, this deadline that Schumer had outlined to see legislative text from the Senate about the, the budget package. And then that day turned out to be sort of a nothing burger. They didn't really, <laughs> they didn't really give us any text, and uh, and that was sort of a bummer. Um, but in the week since then, what has happened is almost better than legislative text um, because everything has started to come out in the open in the media. Um, and so we've seen the carbon pricing discussion instead of it being you know behind closed doors and in these private committee rooms and not really. Uh, not out in the open. Now it's it's being reported on. It's it's being widely discussed, uh, and it has actually become central to the discussions and the coverage of the budget package itself. Um, so so that's all incredible. And actually, I didn't have this in my notes, but I will also mention that that Jen Psaki, the White House uh, press secretary, got a question this week about uh, carbon fee and dividend, and she. You know, she did her appropriate press secretary thing where she didn't commit to anything one way or the other, but she did say very clearly um, polluter fees on corporations <clears throat> uh, align with the president's $400,000 tax pledge. So the administration is leaving the door wide open for, uh, for a price on carbon that's um, the fossil fuel company. Okay. So even though the legislative language for the Senate's budget package isn't formalized yet. Um, we're in a really, really good spot. And so our job now is to participate in this, this ramped up conversation. Uh, we want positive local media, positive social media. We wanna to contribute to this wave of positive momentum and attention. Uh, and we wanna make sure our senators are feeling supported in moving forward on this policy. Um, so it's not, you know, it's still not a done deal, but uh, you should take pride in the fact that the policy has, has reached this level of attention and discussion because it wouldn't have happened without you. So, so that's where we are. And Charlotte, I will hand it back over to you to tell us what we can be working on now. Great, thanks Flannery. Yeah, so um, great work. We've, we've got this far and we can keep going. Um, so I just wanted to quickly go through some of the resources we have available for you to help you um, as, as we just keep on getting that message out there. So to start with, we have our LTE topics, which I've been updating every single week. So we we have those. Those were updated just a couple of days ago. Um, sadly, there is always new climate news studies, weather events. So um, We've been trying to like keep on top of that and have all that information there for you. Um, Flannery just put the link in the chat. So you can use those at any time you wanna write a letter, you can have a look at those and they might give you some inspiration. And we, we also try to give you good talking points too. So um, please have a look at that and, and see if that is helpful. And then we also have our op-ed templates. So this is an opportunity for you to pitch a bigger op-ed to your local paper. And um, we have three at the moment. We have a weather it streams one, which we know so many people have been experiencing crazy weather events um, where they live or not too far from where they live. So we've really tried to tap into that and explain how climate change is just making this stuff worse. Um, we have one called Why Carbon Pricing, which is obviously so relevant right now. So we can we can push that one out there. Um, and it probably is very helpful to journalists because they're hearing a lot more about carbon pricing than they used to. So that's that's a good one. You can tailor it to your particular area. And then the last one we have is a climate grief template. And the thinking behind that is that we really wanted to just tap into this feeling that I think a lot of us have that we We've been doing this work for a long time and we've been very worried about the consequences of climate change and now we're seeing the consequences of climate change and that that makes us very anxious and it, you can have a feeling of grief when you're thinking about places you love and situations that you just never wanted to see in your lifetime so we tried to tap into that and kind of make the point that when you feel like that the best thing you can do is take action it's not too late we can all still do the work and we can we can change this this kind of trajectory we're on so um that's that's a good one and you can tailor it any way you like you can write 
right from the heart you can you can put in your own experiences and your own feelings and and get that sent out to your local papers um and then something we wanted to do just because um, we want to hit the ground running as soon as we hear carbon pricing is in reconciliation. We want you to start thinking about like how you can reach out to local media. So as soon as it happens, you'll be able to, to reach out to your local journalists and anyone you already have contacts with and let them know um, that you're available to comment. But even before that, you know, carbon pricing is all over the news right now. So we have a new press release template that we want you to be able to send out to local journalists and you can and it really is a great opportunity for you just to say hey like this is the work we've been doing for years and now now it's so relevant and we we're really knowledgeable on this subject and this is why we care locally and this is why we think it's good locally so you can push that press release out to all your local media contacts right now if you want to and you can start laying the foundations that groundwork for if Hopefully, fingers crossed, we get it in, in budget reconciliation. So um, that's that's a good one to have. Um, what else? Let's see. So editorial packets. So I know some of you will have already had meetings with editorial boards. Um, you can send an editorial packet, which is a really good in-depth document that will give good background for anyone in the media about our work and carbon pricing um, and it just really gives them everything they need for their story and I know as someone who's a journalist well I'm still am a journalist but was working as a journalist for 20 odd years I you are really busy so if someone gives you a really fantastic package of information then that's awesome so by all means just send it you're doing the journalists a favor when you send that stuff out to them um, and I think, oh yes, one more thing, responding to negative media. So we know that whenever anything gets in the headlines and it's it's a big subject, then we're gonna face some negativity with hopefully a lot of positivity. So we just wanted to prepare you for kind of dealing with those, those occasions where you might see something that seems a bit negative. So um, Flannery has worked very hard on this responding to negative media resource that she's just dropped in the, the um, chat for you. And that really is just an opportunity for you to, to read through. We hope that it will lay out most scenarios to you, how you can react to them, how you can kind of be civil um, and, and make your point and, and really tackle some of these these hard questions that might come up around carbon pricing so I hope that's really helpful to you and of course you know if there's anything that isn't in there and you need help with you just let us know you can you can email us you can reach out to us at any time and we will we will help you and guide you through any situation so please don't be a stranger in that regard um, and I think with that if that's everything Flannery if I've covered everything yeah Awesome, I will open it up to questions. So please just let me know who, who has a question. You can raise your hand or you can type it in the chat, whatever you wanna do. Yeah, and while, while people are thinking of their first questions and typing them or crafting them, um, I'll just add one, uh, one thing about this new resource on responding to negative press. So um, some of you may know, but many of you may not that, uh, that at the staff level, we have um, been working with a, a PR firm since about April of this year um, to really make sure that we are taking full advantage of this moment. Um, and they have given us some really good advice about how to um, how to handle this, you know, criticism that may come up of the policy in this time. Um, and so, a lot of what's in that document is informed by their. Uh, their expertise, um, and particularly the section that talks about what uh, what attacks we really want to prioritize and how we can sort of be proactive on uh, on those. So talking about things like how uh, how the policy is you know maintains affordability for Americans by giving you know giving people a dividend and how um, overall climate action is you know good for the economy and that kind of thing. So. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of good professional expertise behind that uh, the suggestions in that document. So just wanted to share that in case people did not know about our PR relationship. They've been really they've been really helpful. Thanks, Flannery. Okay, so we have a question from Robin. She wants to know: Will a new media packet be created when carbon pricing is announced? 
in the reconciliation package. Yes, we will have all the things for you. Um, we, we will move fast and make sure that you have all those things available to you as soon as it happens. So um, you will be hearing from us and you will find it. Any other questions? Oh, Anis, go ahead. I think you're muted actually. There you go. Um, I just made a contact with the local press, the Oakland Press, this week with a guy named Gary, and uh, I'm writing him a letter because he immediately published my letter to the editor and seemed very interested. And I'd like to send him one item. I don't want to overload him. Charlotte, would you, wouldn't you think that the editorial packet, rather than a press release or an op-ed, would be the thing to start off with? So he, so he printed your letter. Uh huh. And then have you had some correspondence with him? Yeah, and then the very then today again, yeah. along with a letter, another article about electric vehicles. So he's going yeah. full tilt on that subject. I I think you could just write a really friendly email and say, you know, I love that you're doing this coverage. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my volunteer work and then you can tell him all about it. You can say this is a press release like this is a really this is a really big kind of national story right now and there's a local angle. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. And then you could say just for your guidance, um, if you do want more in depth information, I also have this editorial packet attached. So I've just tried to give you all the resources. If you have any time, please take a look. And if you have any questions, I'd love to chat. Well, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be too overwhelming to send him the press release and the editorial packets, huh? That's a oh, lot. I can't hear you, I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, okay, I get it. I <laughs> I can hear you, Anna. I think I think Charlotte might have frozen briefly, but um, but my my one question for you is, what is this what is this guy's role at the newspaper? Is he the opinion page editor, or is he an actual? He's the opinion. He's the opinion page editor. Okay, so the the one thing about a press release is that typically you send them to the the reporters who are actually going to write their own article. But if this guy is mostly just making decisions about what to put on the opinion page, then probably the best thing to send him would be the editorial packet, so that he just has all the background about. Because oh, yeah. yeah. my next job is to find the uh, the authors who are writing about the environment. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So then, so the press. Sense best for them. But what Charlotte was saying is that you can also just, you know, send people the editorial packet as like additional background. So you can just say like, here's, here's more context and information for you as you try to get your head around this, this full story. Like that's fine to, um, to include that too. Okay. Great. Um, I saw Dan actually next and I know we have some questions in the chat too. Dan, you're muted, I think. Yeah, that should do it. Thanks for the reminder. I, <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I'll, figure, I'll have figured that out by now. Happens um, to all of us. Uh, not let me, I'm, not, I'm not the regular media manager uh, for our chapter. I'm filling in for Bob James, who was at the social media call that's on as we speak, as I speak anyway. Um, so he might, but there's something neat that happens in the Atlanta area and I, and maybe other areas know about it, or maybe it's common. I don't know. We have a guy named John Shackleton. Flannery, have they? Been, do they know about Shackleton and the what he does? Uh, uh, do you know? I don't, I don't think this group in general oh. knows about him. No. Okay. Um, he's a member of the North Atlanta chapter, and every day he goes through the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, which is the main. Mm -hmm. metro area and um, paper. And, um, and he may, may look at occasionally at one or two others. And he, he notices all the relevant articles on climate, on what's going on in Congress around carbon fee, but you know, fairly, a fairly broad range. And he'll, he'll send this, send out um, an email to whoever wants to. I mean, it started within one chapter and now it's probably going to several 
several people and several chapters getting called their attention, you know, their attention called to articles that may and edit, ed, articles, letters, editorials, and so on that may deserve a response. And I think it's a neat idea. I, even though I even get the Atlanta Journal Constitution, I don't, um, I don't go through it that carefully. I'm more careful now, but John Shackleton's already been there and he's uh, pulling this out. He's Kate quotes some of the articles. He'll highlight certain bold, certain stuff that's particularly relevant. And I, th I think that's, that works neat for us. And I think other, mm -hmm. especially large uh, areas where you have a fair number of pe people, it's probably harder if it's a really small chapter, but that's a neat thing. And I would think we, if anybody's interested, we could certainly forward some of his to you. So you'd see how, how this goes. Look, if, if anybody's interested, you know, let me know, put it in the chat or, mm -hmm. or Charlotte can cat, capture the names of folks who want that. And I'd be glad to, for a while, you know, not indefinitely, but for a while forward some of John's um, emails to you. So Thanks, that's yeah, that, I'm, that's always great when you've got people in the chapter who can do that for you. We try to do that in the chapter I'm in. We just really try to make that effort to like tell people about the local opportunities because we, we can provide you with national um, stories from our end, um, but it's really wonderful to have someone on a local level to do it too. So yeah, anyone who can do that for their chapter or even share it with other chapters near them, that's a fantastic thing to do. Um, okay, let's see. Who do we have next? Um, ideas for social media? Yeah, I'm answering some of the stuff in the oh, chat. Yeah, yeah I uh, gave David a, a link to some a toolkit of social media actions. Um, so folks can check that out. Um, and then I see, I think Ray has raised his hand so you can take that and I'll keep coming. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Valerie. Okay, Ray, go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, so could you, uh, either of you, Flannery or Charlotte, talk a little bit more about the uh, negative press issue? You know, some of us have been concerned for quite a long time. We've had something of a dialogue with a couple of you uh, about um, negative press and, and uh, you know, false narratives that are floating around the, uh, the press about how our proposition actually works. And we've been fairly, um, to date, have been fairly, um, low key about any kinds of responses, you know, engaging in those sorts of dialogues, kind of shutting, shutting them off into the Twitter sphere and things like that, rather than engaging them, say, at, at the newspaper level. So could you uh, talk, is, has the thinking evolved there? Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I can, I can take this one if you want, Charlotte. Um, so uh, this is the, this is go time, right? This is, the gloves are off here. <laughs> we need to do everything. <laughs> that we can do to defend this policy and um, not just defend it, but be on the offensive right now. They're talking about all the positives, all the benefits, all the support that there is. Um, so, so now is the time for sure. Um, in terms of where you push back, um, I would say generally, uh, generally you wanna go in the channel that the, the criticism appeared, right? So if there's a, you know, if there's something in the paper try to respond in the paper. Um, the, the reason that in the past we have, have taken things to the, to the Twitter sphere is because um, things move so much faster on social media. And so sometimes you can get, uh, like if, you're, if the goal really is to, is to uh, shape the conversation, you need to be able to get your, your perspective out there as fast as possible. Um, and particularly, you know, a lot of journalists are on, most journalists are on, uh, on Twitter. Um, but now in this, now that the conversation is so national, right, it's totally in the spotlight, it's central to the budget discussions. Um, I think that we should have the conversation wherever it appears. So if you see something pop up in your local newspaper that says like, oh, well, a carbon price, you know, a carbon tax would be bad for, um, you know, bad for Montana or like wherever, um, wherever the, uh, the criticism appears, you want to go into that outlet, into that same newspaper with, you know, LTEs that are correcting the narrative with, uh, you know, op-eds that kind of present a different perspective. Um, 
and yeah, try to try to kind of address it there on the home front. Does that help, Ray? Yeah, that's that's good news. I mean, we've we've wanted to do that for some time because you know a lot of local uh, media you know does have influence on your local representative and senators, and so you know if they're picking up the wrong idea from reading the local papers, then yeah, absolutely, we would like to respond in those same organs so that they see the counter uh, counter argument. You know, not to be argumentative, but simply to correct the record on a respectful and factual basis. Exactly. So, so that's great. Yep. Awesome. Great. We got Karen next. Karen, do you want to go ahead? Sure. So Charlotte, you picked an op-ed of the week last week written by a young woman about eco-anxiety. And um, it was so well written that I thought, man, this op-ed really needs more visibility. And I think she was more from the South or the East and I'm in the West. And I wondered if, since our papers do print op-eds and letters from people who are out of state sometimes, if it would be appropriate to ask her to submit that to one of our papers. It just was, I just thought everyone in the United States needs to read this op-ed. It was wonderful. Yeah, it really was. And um, have some empathy for our young people. And we could use some op-eds out here that are written by some of the younger people. So my question is, would it be appropriate to ask her to submit that to one of our papers? I, I think she would probably be very flattered to be asked that. So yeah, by all means, and I can I can um, try and get a contact for you for her so that you can reach out to her. But um, I agree with you. It was I'll find the link in a minute actually and put it in the chat for people. Um, but it was it was beautiful. It was it was very like you say. It's, it was sad, but it was just so poignant the way that she'd written it. Um, all about her her thoughts as a young person and worrying about her younger brother who I think was like eight or nine and um, but I think that's a lovely idea Karen. Okay thank you. I, I might just add one consideration on that Karen is to just make sure that your newspaper is okay with printing something that is not unique to your newspaper. They just would you just would want to give them a heads up that it's been published elsewhere before so that they can confirm they're okay with that. Okay. One of one of the things that I would just like to lift up is the uh, uh, CCL Youth Action Team and some of the things that they've been doing. There are a lot of young people, and they are part of CCL, that are doing these incredible um, lobbying efforts. Uh, David Price, our congressman, was lobbied by the youth. Um, but there's also a number of activities. Um, I just helped um, uh, the youth team put together. I mean, I just did the editing, but. Um, they are wanting to push REI uh, to uh, come around to the carbon, supporting the carbon program. And um, uh, Sharon Bagatelle has been uh, leading that, that group, but it's a marvelous video. These young people went all to these different state parks around the country, uh, one right in the Sequoia National Forest and made appeals directly to REI with their REI stuff and said, hey, you guys need to support the, this uh, carbon dividend, um, you know, they, they started with the previous um, uh, act, but also uh, I guess the way some of the staff there at CCL helped uh, work together to have the ask at the end to really looking at the larger conversation right now. But one of the things that is that CCL is doing really well is, is engaging young people uh, or young people are engaging the organization. And, and I, I think for me, it's the most exciting stuff I've had a chance to be around. It's just the energy of these young people doing wonderful things. So just something to think about uh, that there is a, uh, another vantage point or viewpoint that, that CCL has to offer about the youth that, that uh, we have across the nation that are working together to uh, be aware and, and do something about it, not just sit back. You can you can invite you know young people in your chapter to write letters. I've, we just did this in Greenville, South Carolina, where I live, um, and we had um, a group from Clemson University write letters 
seven of them wrote letters and they were really, really fantastic. It was just really nice to see them like putting their voice to paper and, and being engaged. So um, I think, yeah, whenever we have young voices, we really have to amplify them. I Anyone think the young, people, the young people are enjoying getting to know people around the country through the uh, national activities. So uh, they're building relationships, you know, from Camp Lejeune, Lejeune to you know, all over the all over the country. So it's um, they have they can also be included in that conversation if they just look up in the youth uh, part of the uh, CCL website. Thanks, Ricky. Okay, any other questions? See, Flannery, is there any in the chat that I that we haven't covered that you can see? Um, most of the chat stuff was giving links. Um, I see. I think Ray's putting his hand up again. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, this is this is pretty delicate. So, so a lot of the criticism that we've seen it comes from the EJ community, and I know there's a lot of layers to that. So, uh, I'm wondering with this uh, shift in philosophy and the PR firm you've engaged, whether you can. You know, whether any thinking has evolved there about how to address the, uh, the very adamant, you know, opposition that we're getting from some corners of the EJ community, but where we, where we I think most of us would understand that they, they simply are, are not looking at it through the same lens that we look at it and, and, and are over amplifying and, and basically associating things with us that aren't really with our pro proposal that aren't really true of our proposal, but conflating with cap and trade, for example. How are we, how are we going to address that or are we? Yeah, um, I can take this one too, Charlotte. Um, so <laughs> um, this, yeah, you're right that, that this is, um, this is delicate. We do want to be, um, want to be thoughtful here. Um, so one thing that the, the PR firm that we work with, uh, it's called Bully Pulpit. If anybody is curious about them, let's look at their website, um, Bully Pulpit Interactive. But um, one thing that they that we did as an exercise with them, which was really helpful, um, was we kind of did this brain dump. Uh, so me, our marketing director, Tony Cerna, our strategy director, uh, we just kind of wrote down like, here's all the things that people might say <laughs> to attack this policy. Um, and then we went through with the, with the PR team um, and kind of uh, sorted those into a matrix of like, high risk in terms of like what's really gonna um could you know could stop congress from wanting to move forward could you know could spook people that are up for re-election in 2022 and could really make them want to back away from the policy um versus kind of medium risk attacks that are you know that might affect certain certain groups or certain pockets um but are not maybe something we need to be as proactive on uh, and then kind of low risk attacks um, that uh, that we might see, but that we don't think are going to, you know, sway the entire the entire conversation. Um, and so, uh, and of course, at the local level, you'll have you sort of want to put over that uh, an understanding of like your area, right? So maybe um, if the if the if EJ groups are really strongly and loudly opposed to carbon pricing in your area, then you may, this may be a, a higher risk sort of conversation or attack for, um, for your area and for your member of Congress. And so you do want to, you do want to engage. Um, but in general, the, after going through that exercise, what we came away with was that there were four areas of, of really kind of high risk uh, criticism that we wanted to be sure to engage on and we wanted to be really proactive around. Um, and those four areas are in that, uh, that responding to negative press document. So the four areas are affordability. So um, if critics are raising concerns that the, you know, the, the carbon price is going to raise prices or lead to inflation, um, we need to be emphasizing that carbon pricing is cost neutral for most American families when the policy includes a carbon cash back, a rebate, a dividend. Um, so that's the first one. Um, the other, the second one is uh, like debt or deficit attacks. So, and this is one that's more likely to come from the right. So if critics say that the budget package as a whole 
will raise the deficit. Uh, you know, we want to clarify and emphasize that a carbon fee is going to support a healthy climate and a healthy economy without adding a single penny to the deficit. We want to sort of correct that. Um, the a third high risk one is this narrative about Biden's tax pledge. So um, the president has, has pledged that he won't raise taxes on uh, families making less than $400,000. And that's become sort of this metric that the, the media keeps turning back to and saying, oh, well, they, you know, he wants, they're discussing this, but it remains to be seen if this violates Biden's tax pledge. Um, and so, uh, so that's an area if we're seeing that, uh, we want to clarify that a carbon, carbon price is a corporate tax, period. It's not a tax on, on individuals. Uh, and again, bring up the dividend. And then the fourth area is the economy. Um, so if critics are saying that this will hurt jobs or lower the GDP, um, we want to push back saying that a carbon fee will incentivize innovation, buy America's businesses, create millions of new jobs, um, all of that. So those really are the four highest priority areas um, to, to lead with. And so if you're seeing, if you're seeing EJ push back in your area, um, I would weigh it against those other sort of lines of uh, lines of criticism and weigh it against how um, sort of where you're a member of Congress or where your senators sit in relation to those types of critiques, how, how, um, how much is that going to impact them and let that kind of inform how much you, uh, how much you push back. Um, and then, but I would say if you're seeing blatant like conflation of a carbon fee with cap and trade or like actual just incorrect information about the policy that's being discussed, um, definitely get out there and correct the record on that. And, you know, you don't even have to get into the sort of the merits of different policies. You just can get out there and clarify and say like this, you know, this piece was criticizing this policy for X, Y, and Z, but in fact, that's not the structure of the policy at all. And, you know, so that, that is fine. Um, and then beyond that, I would just weigh it in terms of how much your your member of Congress might be impacted by that particular. Yeah, that, line. That, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Just stick to the facts. Don't get into anybody's identity issues. Just this is this is what was said. This is this is what's this is what's the actual factuality about that uh, about the fee dividend proposal. I was I was able to tweet a guy at CNBC the other day uh, who was coming out with that uh, four hundred thousand um, dollar. Uh, tax pledge of Biden's and he was, you know, he was just wrong and I just was able to correct him on that. So that was very helpful. I did, I, I, I mean, that was very exciting to be able to do that on Twitter. That's, that's, that's something that Twitter is really good for. I, I did want to ask one more thing, which is we, we have so much progressive support now, you know, and, and you, the other folks on the line may not realize this, but I'm, I'm in the San Francisco area, you know, we're, it's a very liberal area and, and most of the pushback we get is from the left. And now we've got this tremendous coup, it seems like, with uh, uh, Representative uh, Jayapal, you know, the chair of the Progressive Caucus, caucus coming on board. Are we going to do anything proactively with that kind of coup? I mean, that seems like a big thing to sell to a lot of people. Yeah, so I, um, I have been making use of that at the national level. Um, I'm, I'm sort of doing that quietly one-on-one -on -one with reporters to say, like, hey, nobody's really picked up on the fact that, that progressives are kind of lining up behind this, like getting, you know, getting ready to accept this if it comes down from the Senate. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely pitching on that at the national level. Um, and uh, so I think in terms of the local, what's helpful at the local level would just be if you're, uh, again, if your member of Congress is progressive, if that would be salient for your, uh, your representative, then highlight that and say, or like, as you said, if the, you know, the area overall is um, progressive and the newspaper readers would be interested to see that there is that progressive support, um, then yeah, you could highlight it at the local level too. Um, and I'll just while we're on this, so Pramila Jayapal is the, the chair of the Progressive Caucus, the deputy chair is Katie Porter, who's also on the bill. Um, so both of them uh, are there. And then Karen Basts, um, who, in the last Congress was the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. She just signed on as a co-sponsor. So um, there is definitely, definitely that support. There was a, a, a 
letter that was signed by the EJ and, and progressive Democrats that uh, was making all those arguments recently that um, we saw it, it went to one of our liaisons, uh, the one that had worked with Deborah Ross here in, in North Carolina. Um, so it was pretty interesting to, to sort of shocking to see that that signed by those two groups uh, as a common, but, but purely some wrongheaded kinds of conversations, but it's just going out as a letter in general. And uh, it's a little frightening that, you know, there's not a chance to have that conversation after people get this letter. This is the letter that was signed by like four progressive yeah. organizations. Yeah. So, so that's a really good example of like in the overall scheme of things, it's 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 unsettling, right, to see challenges like that or to see criticism. But in the in the scheme of things, those are four, um, you know, fairly extreme left groups that don't they're not in the mainstream conversation. So even though yes, they are make you know they're making their critique. Um, it's not something that we need to worry about over much. Um, it, the, we should really focus, I think, on being more, uh, putting out proactive messaging about, the, you know, about affordability, about uh, positives for the economy, about positives on emissions, all of that. Um, that's a better, better use of our energy here. Thanks, Flannery. Robin, I know you had your hand up at one point. I don't know if you had a question. No. no. Okay, it was, sorry. It was a clap. <laughs> it was a clap. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you for clapping. <laughs> okay, any other questions? So if we've if we've answered everybody's questions, um, we could use the last few minutes to also just hear about what media stuff is going on in your chapter. Um, if you're, I know like Dan shared a little bit earlier about how, um, you know, John shares the LTE opportunities and things like that. If you have anything uh, going on in your chapter that you wanna share with the group that you think is, uh, is working well or that you just wanna tell us about, then uh, we could also use this time for this. I see Ray. Yeah, uh, I don't know if this is useful for others, but because Speaker Pelosi is in San Francisco, uh, we've got something of a very good opportunity going where the San Francisco Chronicle invited uh, uh, Jonathan Marshall, who used to be the economics editor at the Chronicle, to do an op-ed explaining uh, what fee and dividend is. So. You know, right now, all the energy for supporting fee dividend in these discussions with the reconciliation package seems to be coming from the Senate. And I've been wondering, okay, we've got 83 supporters in the House. Why aren't any of these folks speaking up about this? And so that might be, I'm, I'm really optimistic that getting that in the Chronicle in the next two or three days is going to potentially have some impact on Speaker Pelosi and get her to say, hey, what is this? What Should we be talking about this? You know, that kind of a thing. So I'm, I'm really optimistic about that. That's great. Well, we, we appreciate you doing that. And please, if it, if it goes in, send us the link. Yes, absolutely. And we can, we can get that out on Twitter for you. I just dropped a link in the chat, Ray. Um, Rep Representative Salud Carbajal, who's also from California, um, he just published an op-ed in The Hill this this week or last week? Yes, um, I saw that. Yeah, so, so some, some of them are starting to get a little a little more vocal. And actually, Brilliant. I will say just on the question of the House, um, you're right that there's a lot of uh, there is a lot of support in the House, but it doesn't it doesn't look like, and frankly, it has never looked like the House was going to include a carbon price in their version of the budget. Um, and there is just in the last couple of days, there have been some. Uh, at least one piece that has kind of picked up on this distinction. It's like, hang on, the Senate Democrats are really talking about a carbon price, but we're not seeing the House Democrats talk about it, like what's going on there. Um, and this is something that just our CCL's DC team is not overly concerned about this because when it when it really comes down to it, the, the Senate has no margin to work with, right? They have to get all the, all 50 Democrats 
to hang together and vote yes on something. Um, whereas the House could, they have a, you know, they have a little bit of wiggle room. Some Democrats could not like it. They could they have a little more flexibility. But so since the Senate has no flexibility, whatever they can get, they can reach an agreement on, the House is, is going to sort of have to just jump on with that because um, because the Senate just has no no margin to work with. So um, so where the when it comes down to it, where the momentum really matters is the Senate. Um, so and as we're seeing, there's a lot of uh, sort of back and forth with the House figuring out you know what they're voting on and when and and the timing of it all with the alongside the infrastructure package. Um, and so whenever they get everything worked out, don't panic if there's not a carbon price in the House version, because at the end of the day, the, the Senate version and the House version are going to have to be reconciled. Um, and whatever the Senate has agreed on is, is probably going to be where they land. So that's just a little more context. Any other successes or things you'd like to share? Well, I know we've had some successes. Karen has had an op-ed recently, haven't you, Karen? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I did submit the op-ed template um, written about eco-anxiety to our park record paper, and they pretty much immediately published it. So, um, and you were the first one to get published. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's such a great template and it was easy to fill in the blanks and um, some of our other papers don't want to work with those templates, but the park record seems to, to uh, take them up every time. So yeah, that was a success. I think we've had so far this month around 13 um, op-eds or LTEs submitted and I think maybe 10 have been published and we're kind of waiting on the other three so we're um, we're working hard at it and having quite a bit of success. That's awesome no you're doing brilliantly thank you and I also want to flag up Robin who had an incredible success would you mind just telling people about what you did Robin and how you got in nine papers? Um, yes, I stepped away from my computer to take a walk and the idea popped into my head for an op-ed <laughs> and I wrote about how I've lived in two houses that had coal chutes with coal bins in the basement. Has anybody lived in a house like that? Yeah. And Anyway, that gave me the idea because our one of our uh, senators recently commented about how um, how much coal we have in Montana, and you know um, how our coal resources are are um, not being sold as much as they used to. Um, so anyway, I turned it around and I said, let's uh, build a, a clean energy future. So I. I, that that op-ed got picked up by a lot of papers. And you, you responded very quickly, didn't you, to, it was in response to, um, a, was it a state legislature? It was a state senator in Colstrip. Yeah, I, uh, I saw that in the paper and the next morning I wrote the op-ed and I submitted it everywhere. I saw his op-ed out there, every paper that I saw his op-ed. Um, I submitted it within 24 hours to those papers and I just kept going <laughs> and uh, yeah and they and they seemed to pick it up right away. That was awesome and, and I've actually featured it um, as the um, for this week in in the um, the writers forum so you can you can go and see it as our celebration of, of our she's our writer of the week so go and check that out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else been published recently that they want to tell us about?
that's okay. I, I would actually like to just say um, Georgia Platt is on our, Platt is um, one of our new editors and she's on the call tonight and um, I have been so impressed with how she, she became a member, she was a member before but worked and then worked somewhere else and volunteer things but she joined our Salt Lake City chapter and immediately wrote a letter to the editor and now she and she's getting published in one of our more conservative papers which we can have some difficulty with but I would just like to um, say she's written two letters to the editor her husband's written a letter to the editor and they've all been in the paper so um, it's just so good to see a new mm. person and someone who's going to be helping me with editing just show up and just do great things. So I'm appreciative of her. That's great. Well, we are too. Thank you for, for joining and editing. I know in they, they actually have this great setup in Salt Lake City where they have editors available in their chapter for anyone who's written a letter and they get a reply within 24 hours with editing advice. So that's that's like really special that they have that service for volunteers. And um, we also want any of you, if you need some help, to be able to use the, um, the Writers Forum, the Writers Circle Forum for that, so that you can go on there, you can upload something that you've written and then you'll get peer advice and editing from our bank of amazing writers because we know we have a lot of very talented writers in our CCL volunteers so um, it's it's hard when you're trying to work quickly and you you might not have someone in your chapter who can give you that advice so we do want people to kind of make their way to the writer's circle and get that advice and that help um, and we know we have plenty of people who who are enthusiastic to help you. So please, please do do that if you need help. Okay, what do you think, Flannery? I don't know, I'm suspicious. I don't, I can't believe that we've explained things so well that you guys have more <laughs> questions. <laughs> no more questions. Um, no, that's good. I mean, I you know, one, one thing that I'm always, um, always trying to keep an eye out for is, is um, points of confusion or uh, just anything that's anything that that we haven't made clear as you know because we're we're up here trying to communicate to you guys what's going on and what you can do and empower you to take action and um, and so uh, so I'm glad to hear that even even in the midst of all of the uh, the hoopla in Congress and uh, all of the the quickly changing news that um, that y'all are keeping up and you you know you're taking action and getting things published and uh, it's just fantastic so um, I don't know maybe we can end with a little maybe folks can say in the chat how they're how they're feeling about this uh, this moment you know CCL being in the New York Times carbon fee and dividend being you know talked about at the highest levels of American politics give us give me and Charlotte a sense of how you're just how you're feeling right now and we can sort of end on a on a cheerful note yay hopeful yeah robin i'm in a better mood too definitely we'll take a bit more hopeful yes motivated awesome well i have to tell you all I get to read all your letters as they come into Action Tracker and it's, I have the best seat because I get to read them all and I get to see like that you're all doing this everywhere and the amount of letters and stuff that's coming in, like carbon pricing is being talked about and written about every day. So collectively, it's incredible. Awesome. Oh, and we have one last <laughs> question here and here from the chat from David. What will CCL do once the carbon tax is in effect? Do we retire? Um, so I know that this is sort of a cheeky question, but I will answer it seriously, um, which is that, uh, well, yes. Okay, Ray is saying we, we pop a bottle of champagne. So yes, for sure. <laughs> We're gonna celebrate real hard. Um, no, but we, uh, so Canada is a good example actually of um, what our next steps could look like. So Canada got a carbon price in place and then um, 
CCL Canada shifted into the mode of let's not only support the price that is in place, but let's lobby to make that price stronger um, and uh, continue to, to build support so that it doesn't get removed or it doesn't get you know eroded or anything like that. So I think there will be a, a real role for us as an organization to um, to continue to defend and support we become guardians of the tax that we put in place and yeah yeah them off of it. yeah yeah that sounds like a uh, somebody should do a movie of us the guardians of the tax, guardians <laughs> of the <garden> tax. <laughs> <laughs> so we will, we will defend and work to improve whatever is put in place now um you know fingers crossed but um and, but then there will, you know, as we know, there's, this is a multifaceted challenge and there's going to be a lot of different things we need to do to fully address climate change. Um, and so, uh, so I think there will be a, a discussion of what is the, what is the next most effective thing that we can yeah. find and work on getting Congress to do and how can we, um, how can we build the political will for that? So we'll just keep, keep chipping away at it and make sure that we you know, our mission is to uh, is political will for a livable world. So we'll we'll right. keep doing what we can to make the world livable. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for coming, everyone. We appreciate it, and thanks for your hard work. Thank, Thank you. you. Time. Thank you.